uh, welcome. Uh, welcome to another uh, edition of uh, Digital Transformation uh, Thursdays. I'm uh, Attorney JJ Bicini, the managing partner of uh, Bicini Law Office. As you know, uh, Digital Transformation Thursdays uh, was started because of our desire to celebrate the 20th year of our uh, law firm, Bicini, uh, Butet Bicini, uh, and to uh, spread some, uh, some knowledge about areas of transformation and how technology affects uh, all of us. Uh, some administrative matters first. If you're uh, watching and uh, there is a, uh, and you would like to get a certificate of attendance today, uh, kindly uh, register at the site and we will, uh, we will send you, you, know, you register on the site, it will lead you to the, the, um, uh, the Zoom uh, sign up page, please sign up, and then we will send you a unique link, and then you can uh, apply for your uh, uh, digital certificate, e-certificate, and uh, you, you'll just need to make a small donation, which we will uh, donate in your in your name, on your behalf, uh, to our COVID frontliners. Uh, we'd like to uh, uh, thank those, including our uh, participants, our speakers, who have uh, so kindly uh, donated their uh, time and effort. Uh, they're also uh, contributing to, to that effort. Uh, so thank you to them. So today is a, is a special uh, topic, uh, uh, court resilience. And what we, um, and this is really a continuing effort on the part of the UP College of Law, uh, the Technology Law and Public Policy Program of which uh, I head uh, and I'm assisted with by uh, Attorney Oliver or Professor Oliver Reyes. Uh, but this is a project that began with the, the pandemic, right? The pandemic created a situation where courts could not operate uh, properly. Uh, and there was a, a strong need for uh, the courts to uh, bootstrap a solution to allow the courts to operate even uh, with a pandemic and to allow uh, court litigants to uh, continue their work and prosecute the cases, uh, but uh, within uh, boundaries of safety, uh, safety only to, not only to themselves, but to others as well. Uh, and at the UP Law Center, we pushed, we pushed this further. We in initially came out with a paper uh, on court resiliency, uh, court resilience. Uh, then we proceeded and actually, uh, and that will be a Professor Michael Chu will talk about it later. We operationalized uh, those rules uh, into an actual manual uh, allowing say for cloud, uh, cloud computing services to, to be utilized by the courts and by private parties uh, in order to, uh, to augment the paper-based uh, litigation that uh, we're all used to. And uh, we're working hard with the, uh, the IBP who has uh, expressed uh, support for this, uh, for this effort. And today, actually, uh, we would like to present that manual of operations so you can see how uh, courts can potentially operate uh, simply by, uh, by using uh, services that are freely available in the cloud. Uh, but on top of that, we'd also like to present uh, a, technolo a technology provider who has looked at this problem uh, and, uh, and actually can provide uh, those services to augment on, on the technology side, uh, the services that we need to uh, make this all come to fruition. Uh, for our opening remarks, uh, I'd like to call on uh, attorney uh, Domingo Egon Cayosa. He's the national president of the Integrated Bar of the Philippines. He's a graduate of the University of the Philippines with a degree in AB economics and a master's of business administration. He's a graduate of the UP College of Law uh, and is also a mediator at the Philippine Mediation uh, Center. He's a member of the Philippine Institute of Arbitrators, ASEAN Law Association, Law Association of Asia and the Pacific, Vanguards of the Philippine Constitution. He's a lecturer uh, uh, for mandatory continuing legal education and at the uh, Philippine Judicial Academy. He's a corporate and litigation lawyer and a leading advocate for environmental protection, alternative dispute resolution, and human rights. Uh, Attorney Cayosa, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you, Professor uh, JJ and your UP Law Center team. I was just uh, a few minutes ago with uh, Dean uh, uh, Deng uh, in the, at the MCLE board, and we were discussing the online MCLE. Uh, we're having some... Uh, technical problems there. And uh, uh, we hope that uh, this effort of yours and this continuing uh, forum that you sponsor 
will really bring out the best in information technology and automation to help us with our pressing and continuing problems in the justice sector. As uh, you all know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my friends, uh, fellow lawyers, your integrated bar of the Philippines under our leadership has been in the forefront in advocating in the harnessing automation, computerization, and information technology to do more, better, and faster in the justice sector. And um, uh, though the reforms or the changes may not be as fast as we wish them to be, we're happy to note that uh, due partly to the insistence and to the gentle persuasion and the public uh, clamor of IBP for uh, using IT, the Supreme Court has uh, positively responded. Uh, first, earlier this year, uh, they approved the online MCLE. Uh, thereafter, or even before that, there were electronic pleadings, electronic uh, dalaw, e-dalaw, e-warrants, and uh, we recently saw the uh, interim uh, uh, remote uh, notarization rules. We hope that eventually, we will go to the real uh, digital notarization. Uh, we also have heard about the possibility of an online bar exam. And uh, now uh, in your own IBP, it's much faster for you to transact business with online payments. Uh, your IDs can now be processed online. Certifications that you need from your IBP can now be done online. And uh, just recently last month, your IBP board uh, upon my suggestion, approve that our elections can now be held either physically or online. So um, we are seeing the result of the efforts of many groups like yours, uh, IBP, and many others who believe in harnessing technology for good. Um, and uh, we're now seeing them find their way in, in courts. We are very happy to have worked with Professor Dicini and my alma mater, the UP Law, College of Law, the Pillow Center in developing the uh, model rules for online court processes. Uh, as you know, the challenge really is not uh, technology because technology keeps on improving every three, six months. The challenge really is managing the change. Our judicial system, our justice system has been used to physical uh, appearances. And that is why, uh, though we might, we may want it to move faster, uh, we have to make room for some hesitation. And many of that, much of that would be about fear and sometimes ignorance. Of course, there are real challenges like our problem with our telcos and interconnectivity. But as the businessmen tell us, because IBP has been networking with them, they say, if there's a demand, we will build it. So we're very happy that this initiative of Professor Dicini and his team now we have a model rule. It addresses many of the practical problems and concerns and even fears of those who haven't tried online hearings and online court processes. Let me just bring you also, uh, that's a way forward, but let me also alert you that in other countries like China, where I've been to last year, we've seen it even in the remote cities of China, artificial intelligence has done most of the work of the public attorney's office. They already have online uh, um, uh, hearings, uh, virtual courts, and uh, in Singapore, uh, they just changed the rules to provide for online ADR and online arbitration. So, tayo mga Pinoy, hindi tayo nahuhuli. And I see many uh, smart lawyers, legal tech companies, and we're very happy working with them. Uh, I can mention so many of them. We're very grateful. Uh, it is something that IBP would want to support your private efforts, your talent, your initiative, please make use of IVP. Tell us what you did. Tell us the directions that you see. And together, let's uh, harness them to really uh, deliver what we all dream of, justice beliefs. Because to my mind, unless we can move the wheels of justice much, much faster in our country, there will be less and less people believing uh, in our justice system. So. Let me congratulate all of you. Please continue with the effort. Uh, IBP, your IBP is here to support you uh, in terms even of uh, actual and financial support as long as we see the relevance and 
and the help uh, that it can bring to our justice sector that needs a lot of reform. So let us all uh, proactively work for justice believe, beliefs, not justice the is. And that's why I believe, and I think you know better than I do, that uh, information technology, computerization, automation can take away a lot of those delays and a lot of those corruptions and inefficiencies in the justice sector. Uh, our country needs no less than that. And we are uh, banking on you guys to take the forefront. Uh, your IBP is there. We have done it internally. We will continue to harness technology with your help. Uh, uh, we will not stop until we can make full use of uh, information technolo technology and computerization to be at par, if not even better than other jurisdictions. Let's not wait for government. Let's push government, let's gently encourage them. And the way forward is coming up with proposals and answers to their fears and to their doubts. Maraming salamat, mabuhay tayong lahat. Thank you, uh, President Kayosa. Uh, um, so this is precisely uh, what, uh, what we're doing today. We're pursuing the private sector uh, initiative um, uh, and, and we're hoping to find a solution uh, to, this, uh, to these issues now. Um, our next speaker uh, moving forward is uh, Professor Mike Chu. Professor Mike Chu is a professorial lecturer at the UP College of Law. Uh, he is a graduate of UP College of Law uh, and is also a graduate from UP uh, on, uh, with a degree in political science and government. He earned his LLM in international business law at the Central Europe uh, European University and also uh, studied public and private international law at the Hague Academy of International Law. He was previously uh, an associate at Sisip Salazar, Hernandez and Yatmaitan, and Lainez Lozada Marquez Law Offices. Uh, he's, uh, he was supposed to give a presentation today. Uh, he's here actually right now, uh, but uh, he pre-recorded his, uh, his talk uh, and we will I'll present it now. Uh, Attorney Mike Chu. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike Chu, and we will be talking about our proposed manual of operations on electronic process and online hearings. This really builds on the paper on court resilience that had been written and um, developed by uh, UP law professors, including uh, our host, uh, Professor JJ Decini, and one of our panelists today, Professor uh, Oliver uh, Reyes. And this is an elaboration. Um, of that paper, it also operationalizes some of the um, important uh, aspects on how, what really to do about um, court resilience in this day and age, especially uh, in this public health emergency where we are trying to limit exposure to each other, um, physically at least. Uh, all right, so why this manual? Well, of course, we know what's happening. There is a pandemic that's going on, and therefore, it's disrupting the operations of our trial court. So we want to be able to uh, still go on um, with our hearings, still be able to litigate the cases and serve our clients, uh, but in a platform that is safe for everyone. And uh, with that, we know that courts have been forced to physically close. And until today, you will see advisories all over the country where exactly uh, where in executive judges uh, close um, courts for disinfection or for, for the quarantine of persons exposed to um, um, litigants or lawyers who have uh, had COVID or were actually um, exposed to people who had COVID or who have COVID. And several judges and lawyers are at risk uh, for that. And also, of course, our court staff who are in the courts day in and day out. And so um, we propose through this manual, the use of electronic systems. Of course, this is not uh, new. We know that um, several courts and even the Supreme Court has authorized the use of electronic systems, uh, except that there is no one instrument or there is no manual that governs all of them. There are Supreme Court issuances, but our uh, courts often tailor fit um, uh, the implementation uh, to their uh, situation on the ground. Okay. Um, what are the benefits? Now, of course, the most obvious one uh, is the uh, risk of exposure to COVID-19 is minimized, at least in the performance of our work as lawyers and uh, 
employees of the court and of course as judges. So we have less person-to-person -person, uh, contact if we do the work uh, electronically and uh, via the different online platforms that we already have available to us. Speedy disposition of cases. Well, before we used to worry about um, getting stuck in traffic uh, or not being uh, physically available at a certain venue to attend the hearing. Now uh, we can be accessed wherever we are and we can uh, attend proceedings uh, from where we are. Um, standard procedure with safeguards. Like we said, there are already um, um, you know, various measures in place in various courts, but this provides um, some streamlining uh, or some peg uh, that courts can follow uh, in the implementation of their um, online and electronic procedures uh, in the conduct of their work. This manual is also comprehensive in that you will see um, certain uh, proposals for how to conduct online hearings, presenti presenting uh, the testimony of witnesses, how to deal when you want to uh, present uh, documentary and object evidence as well, and also um, filing, you know, service and filing of um, court-bound uh, uh, documents, as well as the court sending these documents to the parties and to the public in general. And the annexes to the manual provide detailed instructions uh, in using the platform that you will eventually choose if you choose to adopt uh, the uh, system here. It is intuitive in that you know you can do it uh, on your own. Uh, there is guidance, and it's uh, the step-by-step -step instructions are easy to follow. The we have to set guiding principles, no, because um, not unlike. Um, our, our paper-based system and in-court proceedings um, today, uh, we also have to protect uh, certain um, values, okay? Uh, and certain measures uh, should uh, be up for court proceedings. Like, of course, continuous operation of our courts, they have to be safe and secure, not only from COVID, but also from um, you know, uh, interference, uh, unwarranted interference in the proceedings. They have to be consistent with constitutional rights because um, these cases affect uh, the rights of people, especially in criminal cases. Uh, inherent uh, powers of courts will be used uh, to be flexible and to adopt uh, these uh, guidelines. They have to be efficient. Uh, this uh, procedure has to be uh, has to have integrity, and of course, because we operate uh, on the principle of openness to the public and transparency while protecting data and also the privacy of persons in general, uh, then we have to have measures for that. Uh, while, not, uh, well, while this entire thing centers on party autonomy and the neutrality of platforms, so you can choose whatever platform is fit uh, for your proceeding. Um, so we divide our presentation into two parts, and actually the manual is also divided uh, in two parts. The first part, uh, focuses on the law, really. What will make our judges and lawyers confident that they can adopt the guidelines or follow the guidelines and they have sound legal basis. Um, and we have, of course, we start with the Constitution uh, in that the Supreme Court can make rules uh, in the pleading uh, and practice before courts or in courts um, in the same way that they've um, issued the Supreme Court circulars pertaining to the special rules uh, during this pandemic. We also have our um, 2019 uh, version or the amended rules of court or rules of civil procedure and uh, evidence, uh, specifically with respect to the allowance of um, electronic means for the filing of documents, the service of documents, uh, showing uh, how these documents are uh, served. Um, like today, we uh, attach uh, screenshots of the emails uh, that serve uh, documents to other parties and other interested uh, persons. And of course, the issuance of uh, orders, uh, which is not new because we already have um, um, the e-system or e-courts uh, a few years back. We already had, rather. Um, more specifically, there is a Supreme Court Administrative Circular 4320, among many other circulars uh, issued during this pandemic, that allows the filing of pleadings, service and filing of pleadings um, in both civil and criminal cases um, electronically. We also have, uh, have been doing online hearings all over the country. Uh, the guidelines also allow for 
uh, filing of uh, initiatory petitions and subsequent pleadings via email especially in the appellate courts, of course. But our focus today will be uh, in the trial courts, on the trial courts. The 2020 interim rules on the remote notarization supplements um, these electronic systems. Uh, and um, one example, um, especially in the use of electronic and digital signatures, uh, uh, is RTC Makati Branch 59. Um, it's important also to distinguish uh, because there are uh, substantial differences between civil uh, between types of cases particularly civil cases and criminal uh, cases in civil cases in general uh, we have the inherent power of courts to adopt uh, these guidelines that means they have the power to control the proceedings pending before their courts uh, and you know use a suitable mode or process in this case the one we're proposing is the electronic one to uh, carry out its jurisdiction um, and of course, uh, trials and hearings are also controlled by uh, our judges and the employees. We also have um, the rules of electronic evidence, uh, particularly on the examination of witness to support our guidelines um, proposed in the manual. Now, uh, where do we um, put all these uh, agreements of the parties? Like we said, we uh, rely heavily on uh, or we rely on the principle of party autonomy. The parties have to agree to use the system because, as we said, uh, this does not do away with our paper-based system that is still in place, uh, that is the current system, and so that's the prevailing rule. But of course, if parties agree and the courts agree uh, to use the electronic system, then it has to be uh, put somewhere to bind uh, everyone, and we are seeing the potential of the pre-trial order as in the paper-based system. Uh, to put all these rules together and control the proceedings before pre-trial there's no problem in civil cases because they can uh, we, we also attach forms they can fill out uh, so that they indicate their preferences or agreement in the first place to use the platform and preferences as to the platform themselves and then we have um, so so then all of those agreements will be put in the pre-trial order after pre-trial and after the issuance of the pre-trial order um, we also will not have any problem because the order can be amended, um, although, you know, most of the time they won't be because they uh, have already been issued and can control the proceedings, but they can be amended, especially in this context where we have, uh, when we have an emergency to prevent manifest uh, injustice and also to serve the purposes we have already outlined um, at the start of this presentation. Uh, cases tell us that there should be liberal interpretation uh, of the rules and some of them have to be relaxed to facilitate justice. In this case, our hearings have to go on, right? How our cases have to be litigated um, and shouldn't be disrupted any longer. Um, parties can agree to hold a pretrial or accomplish uh, these objectives uh, if the first pretrial had not uh, uh, you know, catered to the new circumstances. In criminal cases, here we have more straightforward rules in the sense that there are already Supreme Court issuances that allow for video conferencing te technology for remote appearance of persons deprived of liberties. We also have um, uh, the Supreme Court administrative circular issued uh, just this year uh, with respect to the uh, remote appearance uh, or appearance from a remote detention facility uh, in the courts. Uh, when we're talking about uh, persons deprived of uh, liberties. Of course, we also have to uh, put markers um, in terms of the timeline and also the kinds of persons who are involved. So for those who are not uh, PDLs, okay, or not uh, persons deprived of uh, liberty, and before pre-trial, we have the same mirror rules uh, in the civil cases, okay, in criminal cases, uh, where we have um, everything we agree, the parties agree before pre-trial will be reflected in a pre-trial order. Uh, and um, as the pre-trial rules uh, tell us, the court may entertain considerations and agreements during pre-trial. Um, similarly, after pre-trial, uh, we also, uh, the court also has to, um, upon probably joint motion of the parties and also a hearing uh, on what they are trying to pray for, um, the court can amend the pre-trial order to reflect the agreement to use the electronic system to move the case forward. Um, and so um, 
it's important to emphasize at this point that all of these will happen because the parties have consented uh, to the system and of course the court uh, also acqui acquiesced or agreed. Uh, and the pre-trial order will be, will be very important to control the proceedings um, and to stop the parties as well. They, we have suggested various forms, forms one and two in the manual that will be of use to the court when they uh, try to adapt, uh, adopt these rules rather uh, uh, in their proceedings. Um, and one of the things that also serves the purpose and you know, is consistent with, uh, with the reason why we have this manual in the first place is that while we do not, um, while we're using an electronic system, we also again do not do away with the physical filing of paper documents submission, especially because um, the court will need uh, to have those uh, in the record. Uh, and so, you know, it's not a novel idea, it's been used, uh, but we just want to present again the option to have a uh, court contact point, you know, where all papers flow in and out so that we know uh, who to trace, uh, how to disinfect the documents, and they are all centralized. So we have a receiving unit that gets all the documents uh, and releases all the documents. They are sorted um, in accordance with in accordance with the branches in which they should they are destined to, to which they are destined. Uh, and then we have a storage unit to, for disinfection for the quarantining. Uh, of uh, for the quarantine rather of these uh, documents and then a transmission unit that facilitates the submission of these documents to the specific uh, salas or to the court. Uh, we also have specific guidelines on service to parties. This is an important uh, part of the manual and filing of court bound uh, documents. We follow all the rules applicable to all proceedings, including the rules of court with respect to the paper and electronic copies of the documents. And we know uh, that uh, the, the practice, of course, uh, have been to accept um, in compliance with the rules, right? To accept electronic copies, but they've also required um, parties and lawyers to file paper copies for the record. Um, and then we determine the point of filing or service. What's good here, as we will discuss later, is that you use the electronic system like a drive, a cloud-supported drive, uh, you will already have that information uh, readily available to you. Uh, you will note the time of uploading, uh, the time of receipt, uh, who has access, who viewed it at what uh, particular uh, point, at which particular point in time. And then, of course, the manner of filing a ser of service is convenient, it's efficient, and you really don't worry anymore whether the other party had received um, the document that you served and filed. All right, so to illustrate, of course, there are a host of platforms that you can, uh, or various platforms that you can use, no? but uh, we, we pick out one, a common one, which is uh, the use of a Google group, which actually we express preference for. Uh, we know that um, our guidelines talk about emails, uh, but for us, this is uh, a cloud supported drive. It's actually more straightforward because you already have all the information there. You know when the other party uh, view the document um, and the time and date of uploading um, to serve that pur purpose as opposed to an email where, you know, even if it does the work and um, you get the same result after some time, you'll still have to uh, wait for an acknowledgement uh, by the other party. Of course, you can uh, tweak it in such a way that the time of receipt is the time of sending or a few minutes after sending, um, but you can't be sure. So in a Google group or a cloud supported drive like this one, you have um, more safeguards, we would say. Um, and it's quite easy, um, everyone or not everyone, but most of the people today know how to create Google groups and it's very easy to train our court staff to do this. It's important that the court staff or the court has control of the Google groups group for each uh, proceeding um, because uh, of confidentiality and the integrity of the uh, case, no? Uh, it's easy, you know, you click the create group uh, in the platform. Uh, we also have naming conventions. In this case, we have case title and docket number, and then you have more information in the description over there. Uh, you can control who can search for the group. So if you want, if this is a confidential proceeding, uh, that's easy to control. Uh, who can join the group? So since the court has control, it can invite the users. And we already know that today we provide our emails anyway. Uh, and so that's easy to do. 
uh, who can view the conversations, who can post. So you will you won't have um, so much worry about extraneous posts or irrelevant posts or interference or interventions. And then um, who can view the members themselves? Um, you can also add uh, the members by sending emails. Uh, another illustration here, just again picking out, is to how to add and share files. So like we said, um, you know, you can serve uh, documents, pleadings, um, and other uh, motions, for example, uh, in a through a Google uh, Drive system or a, a cloud-supported uh, uh, drive, um, and to to illustrate. Uh, right there, you can uh, just click on uh, Drive, um, or you can go to the uh, site itself. Uh, you add a new uh, document um, by uploading a file, and you will choose the files you would upload. And then, of course, you choose you will choose who to whom you want to share uh, the files. Uh, you have to be authorized by the court who controls which controls the system here to do this. And so you have more protection. Um, and then just add the emails and then you're done, right? Uh, how do you share the link uh, to the Google Groups? So easy. If you're using MS Teams, you use the chat box. Uh, if you're using Zoom, uh, there's also the, a similar function. Um, and then Google Meet, for those who uh, prefer this platform, the same function. Uh, if you're also using Skype, you got the same thing. Um, so it's fairly easy, and, and that should uh, show that point. Um, again, uh, our system also uh, puts a premium on open and public trials, right? So especially for criminal uh, cases. And um, depending on you know matters of confidentiality uh, or who can be excluded or so the sensitivity of the proceedings so that you really don't want um, members of the public to cause trouble um, in those trials or even um, just some uh, interested party to interfere without the court's consent. Uh, you can post the link wherever you want to post it. If the court doesn't see any um, issue, then on, in, on um, its Facebook page uh, or a secret website or blog where you can send the link to the emails of the parties. Those who want to participate, though, of course, the court will have control, no? Because they can, in on Zoom and in other um, platform, you can choose uh, to have the parties enter a waiting room, and so the court, the court can uh, choose. If it doesn't have any issue, then everyone can be admitted at the same time, right? Uh, but uh, if it's sensitive, um, then it can have that waiting room, and all those who are permitted to attend uh, must be directed to be on mute. Uh, if the court uh, thinks it's proper to see their faces, they, they have to turn their videos on or not, then they can turn their videos off. And if anybody causes, causes disruption, then they can be uh, kicked out of the uh, uh, Zoom uh, meeting or the online hearing. Um, right, so the, uh, then uh, we have, um, well, before we have an online hearing in the first place, we determine whether uh, these factors are present to warrant an online uh, hearing. Uh, but, but just to reiterate the point that the possibility of holding an online hearing would already be uh, uh, reflected in the, or agreed upon in the pre-trial uh, and reflected in the pre-trial order. Um, the judge plays the same role generally to ask questions like uh, the judge does in, a, in an in-person hearing, uh, can pause the proceedings like when they do the uh, recess um, can rule on objections, um, and they have to be clear in this regard, right? Because um, you know the the proceeding may not be recorded, or it, or you know parties' uh, internet connection uh, might uh, cause uh, problems, and therefore they can also use chat the chat box function to communicate that. And then it's important here to emphasize that uh, the rule the role of the clerk of court in assisting the judge in doing that. Our manual, uh, at least part one of it, also uh, talks about um, how to do, uh, how to present evidence uh, during online hearings, like testimonial evidence, uh, documentary, uh, and object uh, evidence. Um, to, we use the video conferencing, of course, and that requires a camera uh, and a microphone and stable internet, and of course, the gadget that uh, does all of this, like a laptop or a computer. Um, 
you know, I mean, the basic idea is there. You use a camera so that uh, you can see the person uh, talking, but uh, the court may want to impose um, further uh, safeguard. Uh, and so you can require two or three cameras to see uh, uh, the surroundings of the person, the witness, to ensure that nobody uh, is um, coaching uh, uh, the witness. Uh, and if you want to present evidence, you already have those documents, which in this case can approximate the paper court record, all those documents uploaded in the, the drive, right? You can um, download them or the court itself can control the drive and share uh, those documents. Um, this will necessitate a little bit of um, an arrangement before the hearing if you want the court to control it. But if the court allows you to control the sharing, then you can do that yourself without bothering the court. Um, and then parties should use uh, diligence. In this case, we want extraordinary diligence to ensure the security of the documents you know, to prevent intercalations. And uh, we also have um, guidelines uh, relating to that in the manuals. Uh, but just the basic idea that this is very easy to do um, if you have um, the tools. And um, we also will address how you access those tools in the first place. Um, and then you have electronic transmission of court uh, issued uh, documents like orders, notices, uh, and meetings. And, and in this case, you know, the court will have a pretty easy time to do this, upload it in the drive, email it to the parties as what uh, the courts have been doing. Uh, and um, uh, the e-court system already gives us, uh, you know, data and the experience uh, of this. Okay, so that's the legal part of it, um, or at least a sampling of what we will see uh, uh, in part one of the manual, we go to a lit to the nitty gritty uh, um, in part two, and this is really for uh, the lawyers who practice in courts, the staff and the administrative personnel of the lawyers and the courts. Um, and um, we go to uh, the guidelines on the use of forms to secure agreements um, in uh, conducting electronic um, uh, filing and service and online hearing cases. Okay. So um, for consistency, we have um, naming consistency, okay? Um, we don't want, you know, our documents to be uh, all over the place and uh, could not be located because they are inconsistently named. Uh, so we have um, email subject bylines, um, suggestions uh, as to the names, how to, what to label uh, or how to label the crowd supported drive, the case folder and the sub case folders or the case subfolders in the drive um, and the files and documents always with the uh, case title, the case number and the title of, of the document. Um, and in some cases, the, the party who is filing in the title, but of course you already know who uploaded the document, right? Um, and there is an accompanying note in most cases anyway, when you upload in the drive or in the, or send via email. Okay, uh, you also have the creation of a, like we said, a cloud supported drive and supporting email address for a particular case or uh, proceeding. It can be an email address specific to the case, uh, but for it to be more manageable to the court, you, they can use the court um, uh, email address, the general one used for all cases and just have the name convention in the title and in the uh, text of the email. Um, but just to uh, circle back, we have a uh, court contact point, right, where we have a receiving unit, a uh, storage unit, and a transmission unit uh, to isolate and, you know, to quarantine the documents. Um, but again, we don't do away with that. That's why we still have that. But the electronic filing and service of document um, uh, is there for our convenience, right? Electronic receipt of documents by this court, we've discussed earlier, but more specifically here, the court will create a cloud supported drive uh, for the case and shares access to the parties. Um, we also have, um, after that, parties will upload the documents on the drive, and then the court will keep a record of the date and time when the documents are uploaded. Important to emphasize that this is the controlling uh, information. The date and time uh, of the uploading of the document or to be more specific if there is a function like this in the drive that date and time the other party viewed uh, the document so that you are sure that it has been received in that sense um, right but um, but uh, you don't uh, any more wait for the filing of the physical paper because this can go on for this can go first right the electronic service and filing 
And so when you receive, when the court contact point receives the document, uh, they can already um, reflect there or they won't write anything at all. Probably just a note that it was received at a particular date and time, but that won't be the controlling information. What will be reflected as the date of date and time of receipt by the court staff will be the date and time of uploading or of emailing uh, the document um, in the drive or in the system that was used. Okay, um, you upload the document um, on the drive, uh, you serve to the opposing party uh, by sharing the document. Uh, and, um, you know, we also, we, uh, there are rules that address this also when you want to, uh, the other party to compare the, the, the documentary evidence that you have. And then, of course, confirmation. Um, sending an electronic form uh, of the court issuances, it's, again, the court will issue an order or notice via email or uploading it uh, to the drive. And, of course, the receipt is immediately recorded, the timestamp. Um, or response within 24 hours of the email, if it's an email, and the court can require that. What you need, again, is a system, and this will be discussed uh, in this panel um, more uh, uh, adequately uh, by our uh, panelists. Um, the infrastructure uh, uh, and um, you know, the platform that could be used and whether they are compatible and what specs uh, are needed in order to accommodate the volume and the nature of the proceeding. Um, we have recommended terms and conditions for online hearings, general guidelines, how the parties in the council should conduct themselves, uh, and also guidelines for participants in the manual. We can um, uh, go through them. Um, and then uh, apart from email and cloud-supported drives, just to ensure right confirmation of receipt, to ensure that uh, you have various ways to notify uh, those uh, parties who are interested or persons who are interested in the proceeding, then you also have, um, you can use text messaging or, uh, you know, those uh, those um, messaging groups, Viber, Telegram, uh, WhatsApp, um, Signal, which is deemed to be uh, the most secure of those. Um, and, and then again, your non-electronic means, um, the usual uh, ways of service and filing. And, um, before the online hearing, um, this is more of a specific guideline to the court. The court easily, if, you, if it's using Zoom or other or other platform, um, can set the time and date, and you know, can parties uh, can be notified uh, via email. It's important for the parties who uh, want to join the online hearing to think about the infrastructure. Um, of course, stability of internet is important, but also the gadgets that they will use. Um, we would suggest to use an external microphone, for example, because like this one, uh, because that will be um, easier um, and uh, the sound will probably be uh, much better uh, compared to just using the internal uh, microphone and audit, uh, audio system of your gadget, um, because then uh, the uh, sounds uh, in the surroundings uh, might be captured. Um, during the online hearing, um, you know, login credentials uh, will be provided, uh, password if it's needed, um, but we would anticipate a need for a password. Um, and then, of course, proper etiquette. Uh, during the hearing, the parties, the court can also communicate to the, to the parties via text messaging or the chat box to facilitate better communication. To illustrate how do you conduct an online hearing, if you're using Zoom, you can control the audio by clicking on the options here, the, who the speaker is, who, uh, what microphone is being used. The video can also be uh, controlled um, if, you see, if you can see um, on that panel uh, by clicking that and um, the kind of camera uh, that will be used, right? Um, it's easy for you to join. Let's say this is Zoom, right? You, you jo just click join. Uh, and then, of course, you have to put your full name. It's uh, to up to you know aid your appearance, you're going to be orally appearing anyway. But in order for the court to you know better capture the information, you can just put your name there. Um, the court can screenshot that or screen cap it um, for uh, its for whatever purpose it will use uh, the screen cap for um, related to the proceedings, of course. Um, then, of course, you have a waiting room option. And uh, you can join with computer audio, or like we said, you can use an external microphone. Options, uh, you can unmute mute yourself, you can start videos, but more, more likely the court will 
I require all participants to turn their videos on so that they can see. Of course, uh, in order not to, dis to disrupt the proceedings or not to distract the witness, um, some of those part uh, participants may be asked to turn their videos off. Um, you can use the chat box for this. Um, we have particular instructions for judges and court staff in, in preparing for online hearings. You know, the kind of hardware that we should prepare and also the software, but um, this will be better discussed um, by our other panelists. Just to illustrate, uh, you can use the schedule option. Um, it's very easy. It's, it's, intu it's intuitive, like we said, and it's very easy to do. Uh, you can uh, change the topic to the, the incident uh, uh, involved uh, or should, that will be heard uh, and the details, the time and date. And there are advanced options to control certain aspects, right? If you want to automatically record it, uh, we want to emphasize that um, even if there is a recording uh, of the hearing, uh, that is not the controlling um, you know, uh, record. The controlling record is still the paper-based record, there's still the transcript uh, that was taken by uh, the uh, court stenographer. But um, to confirm details, to correct details, the video can be used. And it's not going to form part of the records of the case. They can delete this um, afterwards if you know everything has been uh, settled. But just to make reference, if uh, let's say, uh, because there are some things lost, right? Um, in online hearings that are, are available when you are in person in a physical space. Uh, and so you can come back to it. And this is the advantage because if you are doing um, physical court hearings, you can know, I mean, you only have your memory uh, to rely on, right? But here, this is really a good thing because you have a video uh, that you can come back to uh, if something um, is not uh, clear in the records. So just click on meetings, schedule it, you can copy the invitation and then send it to the parties. How to record? Uh, if you are not automatically recording it in the advanced options, you can just uh, uh, continue. And this is a safeguard actually because uh, parties will be notified. Uh, you, can op you can choose an option that the parties are notified and it appears there anyway uh, if the, the thing is being recorded. And so um, anyone can make an objection, let's say, or the court can disapprove of the recording and ask that it be stopped. So everyone knows what's going on, right? And you can choose to store the recording in a cloud, uh, in which case um, your um, storage in the gadget won't be burdened as much, or you can just for safekeeping, store it in your gadget. Um, and so you can uh, do this also to, to better facilitate the proceeding, right? To verify your audio and video connections, and you can test this before you actually start. Um, and in, in actual in-person hearings anyway, the court will allow for some time before the hearings to start to for everybody to settle. And so this is the time to do that, to verify the connections. You also will have to um, rethink the role of the sonographer, not rethink in a way that the functions are different, but just how to adapt um, to this environment and other court staff, how they can assist in communicating to the parties. Uh, and we have mandatory report forms. And so one of the good things that we already did for you in this manual uh, is that uh, there are forms that you can use already. Um, um, and then, of course, we have your electronic receipt of court-bound documents in the same way that we discussed it earlier. Um, you, have, you can update your manual dockets to reflect online hearings and electronic filings. Um, you know, for the parties, we often are uh, burdened by uh, going to court to see what's on file, just to, to get there, to get a copy of the documents. The court can easily just upload these documents, or you can easily just access the Google Drive to see everything that the court has um, in relation to the case, and you don't have to go to the court physically, right? Um, and there should be a way for the court to allow, um, you know, the submission of these documents that they downloaded from the drive because um, they're official um, documents anyway, and they can be certified as such. You maintain electronic record for each case. Like we said, the paper record is still controlling, but you have a backup, right, uh, in case, and you won't have, especially if it's a cloud um, supported drive, you won't have, let's say in the past, we've had problems with um, fires, right, um, um, that damage certain documents. That problem won't be present here. We have another set of problems um, when we talk about electronic documents, like corruption, the corruption of documents or viruses. Um, but 
we have better safeguards for those now and remedies for those now. And then you also will have to ensure access to technological infrastructure. Um, and our manual talks about accessing third party uh, providers. Uh, and one of our panelists today will do that. And also getting the assistance of the IBP and of our Supreme Court to facilitate this, for us, especially for those who may not have um, ready access to the infrastructure. All right, so uh, those are the basic things, the uh, uh, rules, guidelines that we have uh, in our manual. We'll be happy to answer your questions uh, along with our, all our other panelists, uh, considering all the things we present here today uh, later. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, uh, Professor Chu. Uh, and now for our uh, uh, last speaker, uh, we'd like to call on uh, Harold Martinez. Uh, who is the um, business development head at SMS Global Technology. Uh, he is a graduate of Electrical Electronics and Communications Engineering from De La Salle University. He was a field engineer at a Pacific Consultant, uh, president at Filmographia and uh, founder of Tidal Solutions uh, Corporation. Uh, and is currently the chief executive of the officer of Encaptive Limited uh, I'd like to call on uh, Harold Martinez, who will talk about the, the technology uh, aspect uh, or proposed improvement or services that can come together with this uh, with this service. Harold, hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, JJ. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Good afternoon. Uh, well, again, uh, my name is Harold Martinez. I am from SMS Global Technologies. We are a system integrator, no? so we. We help build the infrastructure or the backbone of the operators. So, so we work with Globe, PLDT, Smart, other telecoms also uh, in other countries. And so we we focus on telecoms and also in government, anything to do with technology. So we build the data centers, the command centers, and so on. You know? So um, we've been tapped um, a couple of weeks ago, I think, uh, or maybe a month ago, uh, to look at the current situation in the uh, in the courtroom hearings or the trials, no, and um, we were lucky enough to witness a particular one that I'd like to talk about later. But before that, uh, we prepared a a short video lang no, on how we feel we can help in this situation. So if you if you could bear with me, I'd like to show to you a uh, a one and a half video, sort of like a teaser on how we feel we can help uh, accelerate the trials today. No? Are you seeing my slide, uh, my video? Due to the COVID-19 pandemic situation, we understand that our justice systems must be prepared to operate under this uncertain conditions while ensuring safety for everyone involved in a court hearing, and most importantly, the continuity of justice. SMS Digital Studios aim to enhance the transition of online court hearings and make it as smooth and hassle-free as possible. How do we achieve this? With existing setup of sending schedules of online court hearings by the branch clerk and after login of all the participants. The plan is to put two high quality cameras that acts as a wide view and a narrow view within the court room. When it comes to audio, our proposed microphones will output clean sound audio without any audio feedback, even with close proximity participants speaking side by side within the court room. Participants logged in from other locations can now clearly see a live view from the courtroom and hear the proceedings with better sound quality. Digital justice can now be ensured without dragging audio feedback and maintaining high quality experience. All right, so that was just a short video. No? Um and our effort to, to show how we can help. Now I'd like to show a few slides that I prepared. It's a short uh, slide, so just six slides I'd like to focus on to show you what we feel we can bring in uh, in order to uh, improve the process of what we have today. Can you see my slide? Uh, you need to switch the, uh, no. Uh, yeah, there you go. There. 
So uh, again, um, my name is Harold. So we are a system integrator focused on telco and government projects. Now we specialize on providing um, technologies. No, so uh, whether to to um, to create the infrastructure for a particular uh, government or uh, private companies, we do that. No, so so in the past week we've managed to um, uh, witness a, uh, a trial that was done live um, in one of the court rooms here in Mandaluyong. So we were there, we actually managed to witness it. And uh, we saw a lot of rooms to improve. I would leave it at that. So, so let me describe to you how it went. So it took them about 20 minutes to set up. And then after the setup, they started. And then when they started, we heard a feedback, like a, a, a long sound uh, feedback. And then uh, after that, um, we heard a lot of echoes. No? So for about 10 minutes, we were hearing uh, these words. We were hearing, um, uh, judge, can you hear us? Judge, judge, hello, can you hear us? Judge, can you hear us? So on and on. It was like that for about 10 minutes. So they couldn't figure it out. And then at the end of that uh, uh, 10 minute, I guess they finally figured it out. No? The prosecutor had his device on his uh, pocket and it was actually connected. So there was actually feedback coming in and out. And uh, because of that, it was really difficult for them to understand each other. So the setup was the judge was at home, the interpreter, the branch clerk, the stenographer, the prosecutor was actually at the courtroom. And in uh, uh, Bahay Pagasa was the suspect. No? So it was a hearing, a short one, but even it was a short one, there was a lot of challenges that we saw. Now, again, I mentioned that there was a high pitch sound. Uh, it was not clear. Um, of course, because there was latency, you couldn't see the, the image on the other side. No, Medyo, it was bad. It wasn't high, high resolution. And because of that, you couldn't actually see the body language. It was difficult for the for the judge, I'm sure. So there was some disconnect in how they were communicating. They were wearing masks, of course, so it made it even more difficult for them to speak. And the worst part of that is they were actually sharing one laptop in the courtroom. So the clerk, stenographer, the prosecutor, and the um, uh, oh. interpreter was actually sitting next to each other, trying to fit in a laptop. No? That was the setup. So of course, nobody was actually observing social distancing. Uh, to top all of that, um, they were actually connected to the prepaid internet that was sponsored by the uh, by the judge. No, and in Bahay Pagasa, they also had a prepaid um, uh, connection running on a laptop that was shared by the whole infrastructure. Meaning, uh, after this current trial, it is actually going to be used by someone else was also attending another trial. So they were actually sharing just one connection, one laptop. No? So this was a lot of hassle. And then because of that, it made it almost impossible for them uh, to do the hearings on a daily basis. As a matter of fact, when we did the interview, they said that they only conduct it twice a week, no? Tuesdays and Thursdays, because of the challenges that they had to face in doing it. No? So, um, it was not accelerating the way they do, they, 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 they work on the justice, they were actually slowing things down. No? And uh, they were also using the same Microsoft link, uh, Microsoft Teams for, from the trial in the morning up to the afternoon. No? So there was no uh, security behind that. No? So it, it was a lot of, um, uh, there were a lot of variables going on. No? So, so to, to, to help eliminate that, we actually had to summarize what were the challenges. And so, so one, of course, as I mentioned, there were a lack of, um, of a good audio quality. No? They couldn't hear each other. There was no microphones. No? They were just sharing a single laptop. The quality of the video was bad. No? It was pretty bad. It was a very low resolution because they were using a, uh, a prepaid internet. Um, high latency, of course, they were disconnect, may lag. No? And because the hardware were missing, it was a shared resources. No? No, nobody was actually observing social distancing. And when they saved their uh, trials, they were just actually saving it 
on uh, the laptops. No? So if somebody takes home that laptop or something happens to the laptop, all of those are wiped out. No? It, 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 it disappears. No? So there's no, there's no proper storage. And there is also no proper scheduling. As a matter of uh, they had to cancel it because one of the uh, participants said that he didn't get the, uh, the invitation. So they had no choice but to cancel. And because of that, uh, they had to move on to the next one. So these are variables that are crucial to the courtroom when delivering justice. But today, uh, instead of helping out, it becomes a hindrance to make uh, the justice swift. No? So, so these are the challenges. And if, um, if you've seen this, I would appreciate if you can uh, put something in the chat room, say yes, or something like this, if you've seen this, because I think these are some of the challenges that we've seen, you've probably seen more. Uh, and we'd love to hear them no? so, so that we could further study and see how we can help. No? So, so what we propose, what we propose is actually um, utilizing the existing technology. This is not something new. Um, I guess today I've heard uh, the words um, artificial intelligence, automation, you know, um, uh, I would add maybe data analytics, but these are all, um, how do you say, layers on top of the infrastructure, you know? But before you can actually do all of these things, the infrastructure has to be there, you know? So what we propose is, you know, adding on a permanent basis, uh, cameras uh, perfectly positioned in the courtrooms. One would probably be facing the, the stand so that you can see the body language of the accused or, or the uh, people testifying. Another camera perhaps at the back of the courtroom just to, so you have a, a clear picture of what's going on in the courtroom. We'd like to add microphones uh, inside the courtroom. And of course, a fast and reliable and stable internet. You know? So this is key because without the internet, uh, nothing moves. You know? uh, you'll just be uh, storing everything locally. Uh, and because of our expertise, this is something that we can easily do. This is something that we can deploy and deliver. And what we can propose, we can promise, is that we can actually make the experience seamless. You know, it's, it, the idea here is make it seem like when you're attending these court hearings, you're actually there. You know? The images are clear, it's in high definition, and you can understand each other. You know? So, so this, is the, uh, this is the idea. And you want to provide a support and maintenance so that um, the, the, the staffs in the courtroom would have to worry about this so because this is not their uh, core competence. You'd like them to focus on what they do best. So, this is how it would normally look like. No? We have a good PTZ uh, in, the, in the hearing. We'd have a microphone. We'd have monitors that will uh, show in the venue. If it's a judge at home, you'll probably see the judge in, in, in the monitor. If it was uh, somebody from, the, uh, from, from another place testifying, you'd see them. Or if they were in, uh, in jail, in the detention, you'll see them. And it's going to be in clear resolution. No? So these are just some of the things that we'd like to propose as a foundation, you know, as a foundation on improving the, uh, the uh, performance and how we do things. So with that, um, I'd like to highlight the, the advantages of doing this. You know, because of our current relationship with the Pelco, we, we feel that we can actually bring in um, the internet infrastructure uh, we can help invest on this hardware, no? so that there could be proper scheduling of events, proper scheduling of uh, trials. Ideally, how we see it is somebody would just get an SMS, and in that SMS is their link. With that link, you click on it, you'll be joined in this trial, and you can start communicating. It has to be that seamless. Um, again, it would seem like you're actually there, hearing everybody in high resolution and high resolution also with the capability to record the whole trial. And with that, uh, we can say that, you know, the, the attorneys, uh, the judges would be able to avoid traffic. Uh, you'll be able to handle more trials in a day and therefore accelerating justice. You know, um, I guess at the end of the day, this is what we want to bring in is a way to actually improve how we do things today and um, accelerate how we do the justice system today. 
So um, that's that's it. No, that's that's the last of my slide. I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, and um, I guess also one question was asked uh, before before we we uh, when we were preparing this. Is what would be the cost? No, the cost will be um, minimal. Um, if there will be the uh, matters. We were looking at an investment of about twenty to thirty thousand a month. Uh, that includes the hardware, the the infrastructure, the internet, which you know we could spread across the month um, and charge uh, probably the trials no? uh, and see how we can monetize that. But at the end of the day, what we want to bring in is the experience and the uh, capability to actually all to do all of these things uh, as if you're actually there in the uh, in the courtroom. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you, Harold. Uh, let me see. I'm not sure what uh, people. Maybe you can uh, stop sharing. Uh, so thank you for that uh, for that talk. Uh, let me see. Um, actually, our um, our next uh, speaker is. Uh, hold on. I'm doing here. Uh, yan yung problem pag ano. Okay. So our. our uh, our next speaker is not is not going to talk anymore. He will just join in the Q and A. But I'd like to introduce him anyway. It's a uh, uh, Professor Oliver Reyes. He's a policy officer at the UP Law Center, and uh, he's a graduate of the UP College of Law, uh, as well as a policy officer at the um, Digital Freedom Network. Uh, he's also uh, a member of the subcommittee for uh, well, formerly I guess a secretary for the subcommittee on rules for special commercial courts, and also drafted the. Uh, uh, manual of judicial writing. He's done a lot of judicial reform projects uh, working with the uh, American Bar Association's Rule of Law Initiative where he acted as a senior program manager. Okay, so just as uh, I, know, I, I said, I asked everyone uh, to tell me where they were and uh, they've obliged, so thank you. Let me see if I have this right. So, I think it doesn't seem that we have anyone from, uh, from uh, from the Visayas, unless I, my uh, ge geography is that bad. Uh, so we have so, uh, somebody coming in from uh, Kawayan City, Isabela, uh, San Fernando, La Union, uh, Laguna. I'm sure there are people in Metro Manila. There's somebody from uh, Sancedo Village in Makati and uh, Marina Region 9. So I guess, um, region, I, unless I'm mistaken, Region 9 is, must be in Mindanao. Uh, so again, my geography is bad, so apologies there. So. Uh, I guess uh, one other thing, I uh, just wanted to mention that next week, our episode next week is about cryptocurrency uh, and uh, what's happening in cryptocurrency and how we can invest uh, in cryptocurrency. So now I'd like to call on uh, Professor Reyes, Mike Chu, uh, and, uh, and Harold to uh, turn on their cameras and uh, we'll ensue with the open forum. So Mike Chu is now back. All right, uh, so welcome. Um, there have been a bunch of uh, questions. I don't know if you've been monitoring the questions, but I'm time questions today. Uh, actually, Harold, there was, a, there was a comment. I think you asked people if uh, what was their uh, experience. And uh, so um, there's somebody here, um, I mean, the presiding judge who was at home even got irritated with court staff due to breakdown in connection. So they've seen no, problems where the judge is at home and is they're seeing these problems. Uh, he even said that there's some branches that have tech savvy judges who've invested sometimes out of pocket mm -hmm. in sound systems and multiple camera setups with large TVs in their salas so that teleconferencing participants can be seen and heard can, and can also see and hear people in court. So, uh, so I think um, uh, certainly while you know that's not that's not uh, that's okay i think it's it's inefficient to have that if there is a private provider such as uh, your company who can come in uh, and uh, and uh, do that so maybe i'll uh, okay so maybe i'll know we'll go we'll go through brass taxes uh, brass tax as it were as it were uh kasi na mention mo yung uh, cost no so there there are a series of questions on uh, on cost no uh, on a rough estimate how much would it cost um one court to set up one set of the system you're mentioning. Uh, um, 
Yes. How much do you think it would cost? Well, it depends on the setup. No, um, ideally, uh, uh, the the setup would have multiple um, cameras, microphones, uh, right, so that they can easily see each other. Uh, and then there's there's the cost of the infrastructure, the internet. No, so we are one computation could cost somewhere around twenty thousand, maybe twenty five thousand on a monthly basis. So we're spreading that cost, no? meaning we're investing on the infrastructure. That and spreading that in a probably span of um, two years, no. So for that to allowing us to recover, so it's going to be minimal, I guess, considering that um, there are about 15 days in a month where trials are held in a single courtroom. So if you just spread that, uh, it's not going to be a lot of money. Because today, ah, okay, they've already invested on the prepaid uh, dongles, no, the prepaid routers, the prepaid costs to to doing this as it is. Uh, just use that fund somewhere else and make it more efficient. Okay, so uh, in other words, if uh, um, perhaps what, what might make sense is uh, have uh, some of the systems, uh, sorry, some courts have it, some courts will not have it, and then they, maybe they can share, no? the, the judges can just, or the litigants can just share the court resources, uh, which that might be more, uh, more um, efficient. Now, the second part of that question, I, I'll, I'll post that to Oli or uh, uh, Professor Chu, is you know how can we go about and convince the judge uh, that that you know using this kind of system is uh, is uh, you know permissible under the circumstances? Um, now perhaps I'll start. So of course, one thing would be to assure the judge that assure the judge and assure the litigants that. Uh, do adopting these systems would not be in violation of the rules. So, and I think that, for example, the manual that Mike discussed uh, does provide for some of the uh, legal authorities that can be cited in, uh, in order that the judge can be convinced that yes, uh, using these technologies would be uh, consistent with the rules. Uh, when it comes to adoption of the technologies, I think also that it would be crucial to convince the court staff because uh, it would be the court staff who would be um, doing a lot of the operations of the system. And I, in, my, in my experience, even if the judge may be you know, tech savvy or convinced if the court staff is, uh, is, is not, not up to speed, uh, then there would be problems with implementation. Yeah, uh, maybe I would just also add that um, it's not, uh, it's, it's really required by the circumstances in the first, but also it's not so different uh, from what we're doing in the sense that the, the only thing really that you remove from it is being physically present in one place, right? But that is achieved by being present in this platform together, and actually um, oh, barring all those uh, problems that uh, Harold discussed earlier, you could actually hear each other clearly. Uh, and uh, you can share documents more efficiently. So uh, apart from the legal basis, uh, it's also, I think, worth reminding the courts that they've always been flexible, right? I mean, they've always uh, adapted to circumstances or if uh, um, they're presented with novel situations, they've always had the power uh, to, to, to uh, adapt to those circumstances and use the rules in order to facilitate uh, or move the proceedings forward. I have a, 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 I guess, administrative question so far uh, uh, to Harold, no? And uh, I say admin question because as, would, would it be part of the service that you're contemplating that you, uh, your company or uh, part of the service will be, you will have somebody who will manage, for example, you know, the Google Drive for in behalf of the court? Is that uh, part of the service that you're contemplating? It's possible, uh, you know, um... When it comes to technology, as long as it's available out there, you know, it's, it's possible. It's just management, no? Uh, right. In my discussion with um, some of the lawyers, they said, you know, they might want to retain, uh, you know, uh, managing those uh, because they could be sensitive information. So, so oh, yeah. But we, we can do that. It's not a problem. Right. Because I, I'm uh, anticipating that not all of the courts uh, or court personnel uh, may be uh, knowledgeable uh, on a technical level 
na, or maybe even confident enough to, to operate these systems on their own. Uh, so if they can have somebody providing that, that tech support, I think that would be uh, yeah. helpful, right? Uh, anyway, I think, uh, so I, I guess uh, going back uh, to the lawyers, if this kind of system, uh, so there's this cost, no? uh, let's say, let's peg it at, uh, uh, let's say 30,000 uh, a month. So that means that a court, a typical court uh, that uses it, let's say four times a week, times four, 16 times a week, just needs to raise, it's not such a big amount, just needs to raise 2,000 pesos a day in order to operate this. Now, I suppose there will be, there might be some additional fees depending on the volume of work that uh, SMS will do. But my, my question is, um, from a legal standpoint, do you see that uh, this kind of arrangement, meaning the court uh, adopting this kind of uh, uh, arrangement would be uh, okay uh, legally? What do you think? Yeah. yeah I, I think obviously there would have to be certain adjustments to the current procurement rules so that um, you know whatever whatever may be spent officially by the Supreme Court would be consist consistent with those procurement rules which of course you know um, they must be strictly followed but I think that especially given the current situation which is expected to last for still quite some time, um, there, there's already ample opportunity for the Supreme Court to revisit those uh, procurement tools and perhaps even right. accommodate the possibility of you know, uh, raising, you know, or utilizing um, utilizing the filing fees or other, you know, costs that are paid for by litigants in order to yeah. answer for that. But it would so, also so, yeah. So I think I'll 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 feel I'll feel that question. No, I think on the issue of uh, procurement. Uh, the way I would uh, the way I would look at it is uh, the, the government. Uh, if there's no cost to government, I think the procure procurement issues can be can be sidestepped. Uh, so this this uh, is a service, for example, that uh, can be uh, procured by the private parties. The private parties are the ones who are procuring the service, and they're paying it out of pocket. And the courts now are uh, are merely users at no additional cost. Uh, I was talking more along the line of. You know, because this is going to be a lot of electronic uh, implementation on top of the what is usually the paper-based uh, process, and uh, and and for, you know, from a legal standpoint of of making sure that those processes are are preserved for appeal, etc. Do you do you see that there would be challenges from a procedural, you know, uh, administrative standpoint also? Uh, for me, I don't think there would be uh, a lot of uh, challenges here, particularly uh, if, um, if we explore uh, the idea uh, in terms of uh, providing fees. And you know, I mean, that serves a purpose anyway on the, on the paper-based system, but can uh, adapt it uh, to this current electronic system. And also because this is where things are going anyway, even without the pandemic, right? We're going digital, we're going electronic, and this has been happening in other jurisdictions. And so uh, I think uh, it's important, I mean, for the profession as a whole, maybe to also internalize uh, uh, this cost uh, just to make things uh, efficient also. So legally also, I don't think there's going to be a problem, especially because we're centered on consent in the first place. So everybody agrees to the procedure. Yeah, uh, there are uh, a number of questions and uh, I love to uh, beg Harold's in the, uh, uh, beg Harold's uh, indulgence here. Um, a lot of questions in relation to um, um, notarization. And I think one of the issues that, that will be raised is um, taking off oath you know, by, uh, via remotely. So I think this, this kind of system can solve that. Uh, the judge can hold a Zoom meeting, have the, all the lawyers there like, like he would normally be. So I think that would be that could be potentially one use uh, where the, the court will be able to raise fees. Uh, there was a, there's a question here, maybe Oli can, uh, can feel this or Mike, um, Professor Mike. There's a, uh, sabi ni, uh, uh, Ms. Versosa. Uh, I recall there was a white paper on remote electronic notarization being circulated by Legal Hackers Manila. May I ask if the recommendation in the white paper were also considered in the draft guidelines? I think the, the, the draft guidelines mostly focus on 
actual court litigation or court cases rather than um, the procedure for notarization, which usually, well, which actually almost almost exclusively takes place outside of a court proceeding. So, uh, but at the same time, um, I think the Supreme Court did take into account the you know, the, consent, the submissions concerning electronic notarization when it developed its interim rules on electronic notarization, uh, which is a start, which at least accommodates a possibility of uh, parties not personally appearing before the notary public in order that a document can be notarized. Although I think that uh, there still there still would be uh, considerable uh, new rules or additional rules that would fully accommodate electronic notarization as well as you know what was in the contents of the white paper. Uh, Mike, do you have uh, anything to add about that? Um, maybe just to also explore that uh, the procedures that say uh, notarization, um, uh, the procedures when we're talking about video conferencing can also be applied to that proceeding, especially if you if uh, re it's required right to appear before a notary. Um, and you take you couple that with the rules uh, on digital signatures, and you know you make a lot of things easier. Right, right. So actually, one of the other our other uh, uh, audience members also asked in relation to uh, digital signatures, the the ICTs, PN, PKI, for example, uh, in relation uh, to that. Uh, I'd like to throw another question now to uh, to Harold. And uh, so this is from Ronald De Vera. He's asking through uh, our Facebook. So I have two screens. So if I'm looking here, I'm still looking at you. It says, uh, uh, "Let's be really, let's be realistic as well. This IT system will work." Uh, for courts that have reliable internet connection, uh, without internet reliable internet connection, it will not work. Uh, thus, we might as well identify where are those courts that have reliable internet connection. Can SMS disclose uh, what Mbps speed is needed at a minimum to make this uh, operate? If you're if you're aware, I mean that might be an unfair question, but 50, is it a lot? 50, yeah. be, you know, uh, 50 Mbps would be strong enough. Um, so yeah. Anyway, the idea is. Yeah, absolutely. No, you need a strong internet connection. So I think as part of our proposal, internet will also be bundled. No? So uh, we'd like to leverage on our existing relationship with the operators because we do work with uh, the tier one operators. We'd like to bring those in so that when we do deploy our hardware, kasama na yung, uh, yung uh, internet. No? Uh, so there'll be some networking. Yes. Uh, I mean, networking work pa in the, on the premises yes. to bring that high speed. Uh, connectivity to the to the actual court. Correct. Okay. Um, okay. So there's a question here. Uh, how to how can we ensure the rights of the accused when there must be physical identification of him or her inside the courtroom? Uh, that's more for the lawyers, I think. Yeah. Uh, one way to do it, I would say, is uh, well, of course, you, you're not uh, precluded from doing it in court in the first place. If that's the if the issue is really uh, it, well, the issue is important. So if you if the judge deems that you have to do it in court, sure. But I mean, that's also the beauty of um, open and public trials on Zoom or on in these platforms, right? Because everyone can join, and you have a multitude of people um, in a panel, uh, and so all of them can seem random. And one of the ways. Uh, that we can uh, assure that we don't suggest who the accused is, is you can change the name, right? You can just ask everyone to put participant one or participant uh, two and then later on change the names to that. So there are various ways that we can um, address it. Of course, uh, there's always going to be a counsel uh, who should assist uh, the accused in the proceedings and make sure that uh, we don't uh, unduly suggest the identity of the accused, uh, at least in that incident. Yeah. So going back, maybe I'll uh, throw this to Oli. Sorry, going back on the issue of notarization, there's a question here whether, and I'm not sure, uh, it might be high time to allow non-lawyers to notarize, like in the US. Uh, in the Philippines, but we require that the notary be a member of the bar? Is that, uh, I am actually, I don't know the answer to that question. I think that, that is because our notarial law dates back to 1912. And- uh, okay. The, actually, that's the same law that still applies to this day. So the substantive requirements for notarization, as they are right now, uh, they were set by law way back in 1912. And so that includes the requirement that the notary be 
a lawyer. Now, maybe it's a question of whether or not, if, if, if for example, we were to you know, consider allowing non-lawyers, for example, to notarize, um, maybe there's, a, there's an interesting constitutional question as to whether this can be implemented by the Supreme Court alone uh, based on its um, constitutional authority to control practice and proceedings, or would it still require a, um, an amendment by Congress? But I think that before that would be pursued, the one other thing that would need to be looked into is whether or not there is indeed a dearth or not enough lawyers who are spread out across the country the, su such that uh, notarization, they're, they're not, essentially, there are not enough notaries in the Philippines. Although, of course, it's just not a matter of, you know, there being enough lawyers. It's also a matter of there being enough lawyers who have bothered or who have deemed it worth their while to apply as notaries. So, because um, not every lawyer, not every lawyer is a notary. So that's another consideration there. Um, because if it's a matter of increasing the number of notaries, other uh, other alternatives that can be explored is to essentially uh, make it worth lawyers' while in order to notarize documents, so that there'd be a difference okay. of applicants. All right. Uh, I'll, uh, I may have a few more, I guess, technical questions for, for Harold. So you said you can get bandwidth to the to the courts. I mean, I guess we're talking about a, a least line, I guess, no? from a, if, you're, if multiple courts are going to share, it would have to be some sort of least line uh, connection to the court. And then you'll have to lay out some sort of a network locally so that the bandwidth can uh, can be split uh, among, and so that multiple courts can have uh, hearings simultaneously. Exactly, yes. So this is something that we have to consider. So infrastructure without has to be there and uh, it will be a shared resources. No? Right, right. Actually, one of the, and, and we, 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 I did bring this up before, that perhaps one of the ways that uh, this can be addressed, uh, not from the standpoint of procurement, is perhaps your company could cooperate uh, with the local IBP chapter, right? So for example, the uh, IBP chapter in Quezon City, for example, could, could provide this as a service to, to the courts in Quezon City. And therefore it's, it's uh, some sort of public service and you would be the technology provider. You would be, you would be okay with that sort of arrangement. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, the idea is to actually make it happen. No? Uh, right. Of course, is, this is business, but at the end of the day, we'd like to see it happen. No? Cause uh, justice delayed is, you know, is, is denied. No? So, so, Correct. Like, so we want to make it work. Yes, actually, I like the maganda yung. Uh, I don't think that's the name of a uh, program, Oli. Uh, sinabi ni ano kanina, attorney kayo sa our IBP president. Justice Bilis, not Justice Tis. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there's this concept in, uh, I think it's environmental law uh, called intergenerational justice, where the Supreme Court said that uh, we will issue an order in behalf of the future generations uh, who will enjoy the environment. And uh, I remember uh, the late great uh, professor. Uh, oh my God! Uh, I've been uh, his name just uh, went out of my head, and I had him. Uh, Tajar, Tajar, right? Professor Tajar was uh, like to say that our intergenerational intergenerational justice means that uh, court cases cross generations. So the case that was handled by his father will be resolved, you know, at the time will be inherited by him uh, and will be resolved during his lifetime. Um, Siguro, I, 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 is there anything else you'd like to bring up? Uh, I thought, sorry, there are some questions here. It's interesting. For, thank you for, uh, no, for uh, asking these questions. I have one, there's a question here from Ronald uh, Guevara. What's what's car, sorry, what safeguards are there to make sure that the witness will not be coached while testifying online? Um. Well, we uh, in the guidelines, the court can require uh, multiple cameras um, so that uh, one is facing the witness, one is facing the back or the surroundings of uh, the witness. Um, we also, uh, of course, the, the, there's a part of practice where you just have to rely on good faith and trust, right? And so uh, lawyers will have to uh, execute affidavits, for example, um, that while they're there, they're not uh, coaching their witness. One thing, though, that um, maybe we'll need a lot more discussion is because there's a gadget that's in front of the witness. He also, uh, one solution is that another camera is pointed at the computer, but then that's already a lot 
uh, of resources that you need. Uh, but uh, if there is a program that we can develop or a platform where you actually really just limit uh, um, the, the application uh, on the computer to that uh, which the court uses, then we can do that. I'm not sure if Harold uh, can answer that. But I recall in some exams, for example, uh, uh, in uh, other jurisdictions, uh, it's the only thing you can open uh, on your desktop, that application oh, yeah. for the exam. So I'm not sure uh, if there's a, a way by which you can do that uh, for proceedings. So I have seen, I have heard of those uh, those pieces of software uh, where Tama Harold, no? It will just be that app, app that will be open. Sorry, I lost you there. Uh, you see that again? Yeah, no, I said there were uh, there are apps that ensure that only, for example, one application will be open at a time. So if a witness is testifying, we can ensure that only Zoom will be running, no oh, yeah. other application. Sure, sure, yep. Right, right. Uh, actually, you know, it's funny. Uh, uh, you, last week, we had a session on uh, online ar virtual arbitration and we had a, a speaker uh, two speakers were actually uh, involved in international arbitration. And I raised the same question about uh, witnesses being coached. And uh, the approach to the answer was, uh, the, actually the, the speaker was uh, bewildered by my question. It's like, why would anyone do that? Uh, it's just funny that as Filipino lawyers, it's like, it's part of the realm of possibility. But in other countries, it's like, this isn't, uh, you know, this isn't likely or even possible to happen. Okay, so it's been a, uh, no, a very, uh, very uh, enlightening uh, discussion. I'd, I'd like to uh, go now and, and ask you for your uh, uh, closing statements. Maybe we can start with uh, uh, with Mike, and then Ollie, and we'll end with uh, Harold, Professor Mike. Okay, sure. So uh, if you read through the manual, and I hope it will be, uh, it should be available um, once we, you know, we talk, we talk to all the stakeholders, and there's some consensus. Um, you have you're confident that you have the legal basis uh, to implement uh, the guidelines there and it's not a hard and fast blueprint uh, that you can use it's really to offer flexibility but there's some sort of peg of the procedures that uh, you can uh, implement and it's also a way of moving the profession uh, forward so just take a look at it maybe consider it um, uh, you know for uh, your uh, proceedings in the future thank you Oli Uh, yeah, uh, as Mike said, I do hope that uh, Manuel would give be given due consideration. And it's worth mentioning that uh, the principles there need not apply only just to court proceedings, but they could be adopted as well in administrative proceedings. Uh, and perhaps it may even be easier for adoption to happen that way because it would be entirely within the discretion of the administrative agency concerned. Uh, but I do. Also, and I, I know that the Supreme Court would be doing this, but um, whatever technology solution that would be adopted, I do expect that there would be a stable governance structure as well as a flexible approach on the part of the governance structure to test you know, how, uh, how this technology, how these technologies are working, uh, what solutions, what, what uh, possible reforms, perhaps such as, for example, as we mentioned, procurement uh, would be necessary in order to accommodate all of these changes. But it's, you know, uh, even before the pandemic, there has been a lot of interest um, in ensuring that our um, justice system takes full advantage of all of what technology has to offer. All right, uh, Harold? Yeah. Uh, well, as I mentioned, the technology is here. It's nothing new, uh, but I think it takes someone with an initiative to do it, right? So, so if there are courts would like to give it a try, uh, you know, the IBP in Kansas City or you know whoever, we're here to make it work. Um, just, you know, we'd, we're happy to give it a try. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Harold. Actually, uh, uh, I'll take. I'll, um, I was the one who, who reached out to, to Harold's group because I I knew. Um, uh, their, uh, some of the principals in their company are lawyers and uh, are married to lawyers. 
uh, and uh, would be interested. I was looking for some an IT provider, and, and I think they 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 come and they they studied. You know, they looked at the situation, they studied, they gave this proposal. I'm hoping that we can move this forward. So I think it is an important. Uh, this is an important uh, uh, project to have. It might be uh, important even moving forward. You know, everyone's talking about the vaccine, but the reality is that the vaccine isn't a, isn't a cure-all. There will still be social distancing. We will still have all of these other protocols that we'll uh, need to have in place. And so I think there will still be a need for this. More importantly, I think, if we can establish that online hearings is something that uh, is workable, I think it's uh, it will there will be a lot of benefits, particularly for lawyers who spend one hour or two hours in traffic. They can free up their time, attend to more uh, important casework. I think uh, judges will also would, would also benefit from that uh, delay and uh, and uh, delivery of justice, I think will overall be improved. Uh, so on that note, I'd like to uh, close this session of uh, uh, Digital Transformation Thursdays. Uh, I'd like to invite you to next week's uh, session on decrypting cryptocurrency investing. As I told you, uh, in, uh, in 2017 is probably the first time you heard about uh, Bitcoin, where the Bitcoin price went from, uh, let's see, I think about uh, $1,000 to $20,000. And then it, it collapsed uh, to $3,500. Uh, this year, Bitcoin is up about, um, I think about uh, 200%. And there, so it's now, at the, it's now reaching the 20,000 mark uh, today. And I think it's timely to talk about it now because we believe, a lot of people believe that Bitcoin and other uh, cryptocurrencies are going to run, have a bull run next year. Um, and there are ways, you know, because the, the government did license uh, virtual currency exchanges in the Philippines. There are legal ways by which uh, Filipinos can invest uh, in, these, uh, in these areas. And we have a, a guest next week, uh, Colin Goltra, who's a director uh, for Binance for Southeast Asia Growth. Uh, and he will be uh, with us. And we hope you can join us uh, for that one. Uh, final note, uh, for those who want to get uh, a certificate of, of attendance, uh, please uh, sign up uh, at our Zoom link, you know, uh, at the site, you'll get the Zoom link, make sure you sign up, then we will send you a, uh, a, uh, a unique link and then you can make your donation. Please, uh, you know, please make a donation for our, you know, for our COVID frontliners. Uh, and on that, uh, on that note, I'd like to close this session of uh, Digital Transformation Thursdays. Uh, thank you.